So uh, I get the honor, and I say honor because I consider myself exactly like you. I know you guys uh, watch these inspiring women, all the faces um, that are over here on this banner, uh, whether they're on the field or now you're meeting them for the first time. Um, but Julie Foudy is, uh, has always been an inspiration for me. And I am not ashamed to say I am from Ohio. I grew up in a very small town called Alliance, Ohio. Uh, in the northeast portion, and I was back to visit my parents. We, they still live in my childhood house. I still have my bedroom, which is rather embarrassing because it looks the same, and I mentioned already that I'm 34, so it's, come on, Mom, time to redecorate. Uh, and in my bedroom, there is still a poster of Julie Foudy on my wall. So for me to be able to stand up here and try to adequately introduce this wonderful lady uh, is a little, little nerve-wracking, but um, she is, <laughs> well, you guys know, uh, she's on my wall at my house. Uh, she is the former U.S. Women's National Team captain. She is a two-time FIFA World Cup champion. Seriously? That's really awesome. Uh, a two-time Olympic gold medalist and has since she's retired to create an entire new career for herself. Think about it for a moment. She has played at the highest level, on the highest stage, in the biggest moments. Uh, I would have loved the chance to do that. And then when you retire as an athlete, that's all you know, right? So you have to think, what a scary moment when you decide to hang up your boots and try to do something different. And I know uh, Claudia Martinez over here from Fox Sports is in PR, and she talks to athletes all the time when it's like, hey, what's your next move? How can I help you? I bug her all the time, too. So I have to imagine that that's a scary moment, and it's like, what are we going to do next? Well, she made an entire new career for herself. She is an author. She is the founder of the Julie Foudy Sports Leadership Academy, and she is an analyst with ESPN. She also, by the way, uh, was in South Korea. Did anybody watch the Winter Olympics? Anybody see Julie? She did a heck of a job, right? Love it. So she uh, skated back from South Korea. She went to Columbus, endured the weather. I think she also had a pretty scary flight to get here, but she is here today to talk about her pathway to success and also help inspire us to achieve our own dreams. Everyone, please help me give a very, very warm welcome to Julie Foudy. That was the nicest introduction ever. Oh, thank Can you. I come with you? That is so sweet. Um, hi, everyone. How goes it? How are we doing? Are we good? This is so cool. I'm very excited. I get the whole stage too. I'm a wanderer. Um, I, the perks of coming to the She Believe Summit, I don't know if you guys had any troubles getting in, uh, but I got on the, I don't know if this is actually able to be public information, but what happens at the summit stays at the summit. <laughs> um, I actually yesterday got a call from Alejandra who was like, uh, woke me up, uh, you need to get on the charter plane. And I said, what charter plane? I'm on a four o'clock, I'm fine. I was in Columbus, Ohio calling the game. Uh, and she's like, oh no, all flights are canceled. I'm like, no, mine flight's at four, I'm good. She's like, we had to schedule a charter with the entire national team and you get the last seat. And I look at my phone and it's like, Delta, Delta, flight canceled, flight canceled, flight canceled. Uh, and I was like, oh hell yes, I'm getting on that charter. <laughs> Um, but the fact that I have a green sweater on uh, is not reflecting up to my face. I am still green from the flight in, actually. I don't know uh, how many of you guys actually had to fly in, but it was, at one point, I was like, tell my kids I love them. <laughs> Please tell them I love them. Uh, it was crazy, but I'm here. I'm very excited about it. I'm very excited that U.S. Soccer put this all together for, for you all. And, uh, and for us, it's like a little reunion, so it's great as well. Later in the day, you're going to see and hear from some of my former teammates. We have another former teammate in the house, Mary Harvey's in the back. You're gonna hear from her a little bit later. Um, but I wanted to talk to you guys about something that is very near and dear to me. Uh, Katie mentioned that I am an author, and so uh, I'd like to say I, to my kids, I'm a very important author. Uh, but one of the things I wrote about in the book um, is something I actually learned from playing sports. And uh, I actually put a little, little presentation together so I look official, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, but one of the first things I learned 
When I was with the national team, one of the women who worked with our national team, uh, who's just phenomenal, Dr. Colleen Hacker, she uh, threw this quote up there on the board. And I didn't learn this until I was in college. And all of a sudden, I was like, wait a second. It was, this, it was like this epiphany, this moment where you go, success isn't a matter of chance, but a matter of choice. Like, I get to choose that? And I had grown up, mind you, in a different era than you guys. I'm a little bit older. But in, in when I was a kid and I was reading history books, or I was uh, you know, going through, we had actually encyclopedias uh, and, and racks of them. Uh, you know, the thing you always read about was that leadership came in the form uh, and successful people came in the form often of a white man who maybe was sitting on a horse with a tall hat and a sword. And, um, and that's you know, a very different narrow definition of leadership. That leadership came in a position of power, a president, a CEO, uh, a politician. Right? And often in those positions of power were white men, because that was what I was reading about. And so it wasn't until I started playing on the national team, actually, that I was surrounded by all these amazing women that I realized that my definition of leadership was very narrow. And that, in fact, uh, if you swapped out right, the word success with leadership, that leadership is actually a matter of chance isn't a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice, that you too could lead. And this again became this incredible epiphany because I was watching all these women like Mia Hamm, who you might have heard of, she was pretty good. Uh, right? Mia was this really quiet leader who hated the spotlight and was never the one in the middle of the huddle pounding her chest, you know, let's go. Mia did things very quietly. And that's how she was. And yet it was so incredibly effective as I watched her over the years in her form of leadership, right? Brandi Chastain, the one who got naked in 1999. When she led, she was like an energizer bunny. It was a very different style of leadership. My nickname was Loudy Fowdy, so you can imagine what my style was, right? And I'm watching Christine Lilly, a player you're gonna hear from later today, who was so quiet as well very similar to Mia, but led with the most classy, selfless example you've ever seen. Was always the fittest, was always the first to show up. I mean, did everything to the highest standard. And so I'm watching all these women do all these things, and I'm realizing that, my gosh, for all these years, I had the total wrong definition of leadership. That leadership is personal, not positional. It's what you are. Right? And the gift of that is that we were blessed with this team with this incredibly diverse set of leaders. I mean, imagine if you had a bunch of, of Loudy Fowdies, Brandy Chastain, the Energizer Bunny, or Abby Wambach, who we once got a t-shirt who said, which said, help me, I'm talking and I can't shut up. <laughs> right? Imagine if it was a team of those like talker, more verbal people. We would have driven everyone crazy, but we had this incredible balance of the Mias and the Lils um, and the Joy Fawcett's who literally for the first 10 years on the national team did not say a word. But when she spoke, you knew like you better listen because Joy was always spot on. She would be the first one you brought onto your team in any team building event because Joy could solve. And when she spoke, everyone would literally be like, shh, Joy is talking. <laughs> so that was the beauty of what made that group is the balance of that. And I think a lot of people grow up thinking, you know, I'm not in a position of power. I'm not a politician. I, I didn't get a formal education in leadership training, or I don't have a master's or a PhD in leadership development. And so they think they can't lead, and I, and it drives me crazy because that couldn't be further from the truth, right? But the hard part about it is you have to then choose to lead, right? That's the second part of the equation. Leadership isn't a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. And choosing can be scary. I get it, right? It can be really scary because, you know, how many times do you find yourself in a situation where you want to raise your hand and you're like, yeah, no, I don't think I'm ready. I'm good. I'm not going to raise my hand, right? So to help you with that, one of my favorite women, Eleanor Roosevelt, has a quote that says, do one thing every day that scares you. So um, Amanda, 
Can you demo for me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Don't look around. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Come on, Amanda. Come on, sister. Round of applause for Amanda. She had no idea she was doing this today. Yes, come on up. All right, so I'm going to help you cross this off your bucket list today. I don't know if you've done one thing yet. Come on, Amanda. Get up here, sister. Careful, it's slippery, I heard. Yeah. OK, so um, I'm going to have you guys do a quick little activity because you've been sitting. Um, and we do this thing because I'm going to help you get out of your comfort zone because getting out of your comfort zone is a little bit scary. So we do this exercise at our leadership academy. It's called I am comfortable with crazy. OK, you are going to turn to a partner. You're going to say to your partner and hopefully it's someone you do not know. So find someone next to you on your row or behind you that you not yet that you don't know. You're like the kids. Not yet. <laughs> OK, and you're going to go. Hi, I'm Julie. Hi, I'm Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. Good job. <laughs> you're doing great. OK. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> so you're going to turn to Amanda, and you are going to, you only have about 10 seconds, but think of your favorite song, <laughs> and you're going to sing it in your best opera voice. OK? <laughs> do, you, do you know your favorite song? I, I have one. You have it? <laughs> Do you want me to go first, or do you want to? And, and this is like a sing-off, right? This is a competition, people. <laughs> do you want to go first? I'm going to warm it up. <laughs> I want you to go first. Oh, yes. OK. All right. All right. And you guys are going to be doing this simultaneously. And I want, to, like, I want the roof to blow off Nike headquarters. Thank you, Nike, for having us, by the way. I should have said that first off. Um, my favorite song is the national anthem. <laughs> Are you ready? Who can you see? <laughs> Do you want some more? <laughs> By the dawn's <laughs> early light. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think? Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, what's your favorite song? Please tell me it's like MC Hammer or something like that. P. Diddy. Tina Turner, What's Love Got to Do With oh, It? Oh, yes! <laughs> Give it to me! Right. I'm not an opera singer. No, so. you got to be an opera singer right now, <laughs> man. <laughs> oh, oh, what's love got to do, got to do with it? <laughs> what's love got a second hand emotion? <laughs> Amanda, clap off for Amanda. <laughs> Julie? What? <laughs> Big round of applause for Amanda. <laughs> All right, so stand, introduce yourselves. You say your favorite song. I want the roof to be blowing off this place. Everyone should be doing it, even you, Rachel Epstein, in the back. I'm not hearing nearly enough singing. <laughs> not nearly enough singing is happening. I have to bring my mic over, aren't I? <laughs> I like it. You're getting the hands involved. Opera singers use their hands. All right, take a seat. Take a seat. Oh, 
that's good. It's funny to see like the different reactions of people because um, I, there's definitely those who are like, damn that Julie Foudy. <laughs> and the fact that she's even here today making me stand up, it's only 10 a.m. And then there's those like you two rock stars in the front, what are your first names? Carla and Erica who are hands out and everything. Um, but I, I mean, and especially if you don't know that person, the reason I love these exercises is you're turning to a complete stranger and making a total AWS out of yourself, really, <laughs> right? And it's the beauty of saying, I'm, that's okay, I'm uncomfortable with doing this and I'm gonna be okay with getting out of my comfort zone. And I will tell you, if you can get that skill set down, right, then this is what happens because there's your comfort zone, but what exists outside your comfort zone? It's one of the greatest skill sets in life is that is where the magic happens in life. You have to get out of that comfort zone, right? And I wish I could tell you there was a secret sauce to it, but often it just takes actually doing it and taking that step and being courageous enough to take that step and raise your hand. Because when you do, this is the feeling you have. It's one of my favorite videos of all time. I show it every time I talk because this really is a microcosm of what this picture represents. This is a eight-year-old girl at the top of a ski jump in Utah. Check this out. Don't be fine. Don't be fine. Don't do it. Don't do it. Still, she's saying just a longer 20, just a longer 20, because now she's on a 40 meter uh, jump. And you can hear her hyperventilating and she's trying to talk to herself. Like it's the same thing, it's just a little bit bigger, it's the same thing. So now she's on the 40, she's doing the 40, and her dad said something really critical to her at the top of the jump. Did you catch that? He said, whatever you do, do not slow down. You gotta take that hill and you gotta charge it, right? So she gets to the bottom of her 40, and what was the last thing she says? 60 seems like nothing now. And that's the beauty of getting out of your comfort zone because when you get out of there and you realize, which you will, shoot, what was I scared about to begin with? I can do this. And not only can I do this, I'm doing this quite well, right? And again, I wish I could say, here's the secret formula to doing that every time, but I have found these things help, right? One, and this is something that we had built in with our national team, is gather your team around you, right? And if it's a, a soccer team, if it's family and friends, but what is your dream team? Because you need them in those moments. When we started on the national team, we had no women's World Cup back in the 80s. We had no women's soccer in the Olympics, and we were a bunch of feisty teenagers who kept asking why. Why not? Why don't we have both of these things? And people all the time, would say to us, stop dreaming that nonsense up. Stop asking for things when women's soccer is not even popular. They don't even play it in this country. This isn't our national sport. And we were like, what? Why shouldn't we be dreaming these things up? The men have had a women's world, had had a World Cup for a century. Why can't women also have a women's World Cup? And they kept saying to us, which is the number two on here, you're crazy. You're crazy to dream these big dreams. And we'd say, no, nah, we don't think we're crazy. We think we're actually courageous. But it takes a team of people around you when you do think, well, maybe I am crazy, to say, no, you're not crazy. They're the crazy ones. You're the courageous one. So who is your dream team around you? Get the right people in place. That when you tell someone, hey, I've got this awesome idea. I'm going to do this. Do you have those friends around you that are like, wah, wah, that's lame. Good luck. <laughs> Right? How many of us have those friends? I've had them. Right? Get rid of the Debbie Downers in your life and gather a team around you. And that's where I feel really blessed with sports is I had mine built in with these incredible national team teammates who whenever we doubted anything we were doing, you had a teammate that said, no, we're fine. Let's keep going forward. Right? The third one is something I think 
and I talk a lot about this in my book, I don't think we women do enough of is own our awesome. We women are great at being like, yeah, no, you know, I'm good. I, you know, I'm going to stay humble. I don't need to brag about what I've been doing. And I get that, right? We want to be humble and we want to be respectful, but we also have to tell people how damn awesome we are, <laughs> right? And we don't do that enough. We make a list of excuses to tell them why we're not ready, why we can't do that yet, right? We are really good at making sure every box is checked before we're willing to raise our hand. And we have to realize that if you wait for every single box to be checked, to be ready, that opportunity is gone, long gone. You're never going to have every box checked. So forget the idea of feeling like you're 100% ready. It's not going to happen, which is part of that getting out of your comfort zone. Because when you then realize, like, look, that person next to me raising their hand probably isn't ready either, but they're raising their hand. And the last one I will tell you, and this one I learned from a friend, Mary Carrillo, who is a rock star in television, covered the Olympics uh, for NBC. She does HBO Real Sports as well. Uh, and, and Mary is, I think, a giant in television because she does so many diverse things. And so when I was first getting into television, I said, Carrillo, how did you go from being a professional tennis player to covering tennis, but not just tennis? Like, she does a diversity of things. She makes documentaries. I mean, she does so many wonderful features. And she said to me this story I'll never forget. She goes, you know, when, they, when I got into the business and NBC would call and they'd say, hey, do you want to host figure skating? Carrillo would laugh and she'd go, I'd raise my hand and say, and she said, this idiot said yes. And she'd say, and then they'd go, she goes, I had no idea about ice skating, but this idiot, and she's laughing, said yes. I said, what about when, you know, they asked you to host late, the late show for NBC, what would you do? And she goes, this idiot said yes, <laughs> right? She didn't know about figure skating. She didn't know about how to host the late show. But Carrillo said, I'm willing to raise my hand, even though I don't check every box, right? And I think that's the most critical thing we can give. And the biggest gift we can give each other is to encourage other women to step out of that comfort zone and raise their hand. Be the idiot who says yes. You will not regret it. And lastly, I'll leave you with this, and we'll open it up for questions. This is the thing that I hope every young girl in every corner of the world recognizes, right? I think leadership is a matter of choice, not a matter of chance. So choose to matter because you can. You guys control that. That's the really cool thing. Thank you so very much. We'll open it up for questions, and then I have one other quick announcement I'm going to make. Or you could just sing opera with me if you want to do that, too. OK, it's a little bit difficult. Uh, what was your biggest failure, and how did you rebound? Great question. What's your name? I'm Sarah Zimmerman from the University of Pennsylvania. Awesome. Um, Hi, Sarah. Uh, biggest failure and what did I rebound from? Um, that's a great question. I had a lot of failures. So <laughs> I, I think, and I heard in the panel before me, I couldn't uh, see who was speaking, but I heard you guys talking about failure, which I love, because um, I, I think that's another huge thing. I call it the F word that no one wants to talk about. But uh, it's the most important F word we should be talking about, because it's really this gift. I think probably the biggest failure um, was just trying to get to a place, and I saw this as a, as a negative back in the day, trying to get to a place where I felt I could do it. So whether it was the national team, whether it was uh, broadcasting, right? And I think we all go through those doubts and your sweaty palms, pitting, whatever it is, and I got to a place, and it took me many years on the national team to feel like, and I think people think for national teamers or for um, Olympians that, oh, I just got to that level, and I was like, hey, I belong. This is cool. 
No, that's not the case. I had doubts for years. And it wasn't probably until my late 20s that I finally realized, like, good Lord, sister, <laughs> let's go. You're fine. Right? And again, a lot of that is what I'm talking about today is letting go of the need, which I think we all women share, which is what I love most about women is we're really disciplined and we're, you know, we're making sure that we've checked all the boxes like I talked about. But sometimes we got to let that go and say, you know, it's okay. You're not going to check every box and you're still awesome. And you're going to still be contributed in a positive way. And once I got to that frame of mind where I was able to step out of that um, and accept that maybe some of my deficiencies weren't necessarily failures, but a gift I could grow on, uh, then life starts to open up. And I really believe that. So that's a great question. Jog it out, Alejandra. Um, hello, I'm Francesca. I Hi, Francesca. <laughs> um, I attend school at NYU in the city. Nice. Um, so I play soccer in college, and one of my Woo! biggest... <laughs> One of my biggest fears when I am finished with college is not being able to play anymore. And yep. I was just wondering how you coped with that and how you dealt with not being able to play the sport you love and that you've defined yourself with your entire yeah. life. It's a hard transition. And mind you, I, so when I was, I can remember I was sitting on my balcony my senior year at Stanford and I was about to wrap up and graduate and I remember having like this all of a sudden, like almost a panic attack of like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with my life? And I looked down and there was like a gardener blowing leaves. And I was like, I can always do that. <laughs> I can do that. Um, and, and I was actually on the national team, like playing, like I had soccer in my future, but I get that angst. Um, and what I will tell you is, that the great thing about playing a sport is that you have this incredible skill set that now transfers to this next life, right? You know how to work with teammates, work within a group, deal with adversity and loss. You have great habits because you've been honing those for years on discipline and hard work and all these things that will serve you in this next life. And you will also also have this world that allows you to keep playing soccer. And it may not be at the same level you were playing, but there, I know around here there's a ton of things. So I'm always getting invited to come play in them uh, with soccer that people could play in. And so you'll always have that. And, and I think you'll find a new team that you can play with. But I think the biggest challenge for young women is they don't think that skill set is transferable. And I'm here to tell you that you actually have, and our leaps and bounds above anyone else coming out of college who hasn't played a sport because of that. And know that when you go into an interview, what you bring, so many, and you ask any of these corporate women in here, so many corporations are dying to find student athletes and female student athletes because they find they're the best leaders. I mean, look at the C-suites of all the Fortune 500 companies. 94%, I think is the statistic, 94% of them are athletes. And so it's a skill set that people are craving to have. So again, do not undersell yourself. Own that awesome when you go into that next phase because you will be just fine. Great question. Oh, I'm sorry. She's going to that side. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brianna. I go Hi, to Brianna. Um, Johnson Wales University in Rhode Island. And I'm How was your trip in? Oh, I actually live in New Jersey, New Jersey. Oh, so good. we were home for a break. So oh, perfect. Easy trip in. Yeah, um, you're not green. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm actually a part of the women's basketball team there. And towards cool. the end of our season, a lot of my teammates had doubt that we were going to make it past a certain round in the tournament. And you know, I wanted to keep a positive mindset, but didn't know how to go about it in the right way. So my question is, how do you respond? positively when everyone around you is doubting you know, themselves and the team as a whole? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, this is a huge one for me, right? Attitudes are contagious, is yours worth catching? Was a phrase that I loved 
Again, another Colleen Hacker phrase, attitudes are contagious, is yours worth catching? And this is a really cool thing because I think a lot of people, when they think of team chemistry, they think of it as being driven by the captain or the superstar or the goal scorer or uh, the leading point scorer. And they don't think of team chemistry and the ability to affect team chemistry as really a team deep exercise. And in fact, when we would choose and go in with the coach, Carla Overbeck, who was the captain with me, uh, we would go in, and as we'd get to an Olympics or a World Cup, we would go in to a coach and say, hey, we'd like to give you our, if the roster was 20, for example, we'd say, hey, we'd like to select players 18, 19, and 20. And they'd be like, what? We're going to select, we want you to know who we think should be 18, 19, and 20. You choose the rest of the team, but those three are the most critical to us. And do you know why? Because those three, right, and the players who aren't playing are, I think, the most critical to setting the attitude of the team. And there is a misconception that it has to be done from the top down. I say it's done from the bottom up, actually, in terms of the player that maybe isn't getting the most minutes, the player that's not scoring goals. What kind of attitude do they bring to the bench right, to any environment, because if you get that right and you get players that buy in and make them feel important and valued, which we did a lot of, right, for example, if we were uh, playing a game, we would look at uh, who started that play. We call it who started it. So when we're watching film, it wouldn't be who scored the goal, who had the assist, or even who made a run to get to the assist. It would be that first toe poke by a defender that happened 15 plays earlier um, because she's actually what started the transition, what then got us the goal, and you celebrate that person. And so figuring out a way with your group to make all those players feel valued and that they matter and that their attitude is so important because it is contagious. And so as soon as you see that, you nip it, right? And... Um, and regardless of what your role is on the team, if you can collectively convince the group that if we together stand together in a positive way, we can move mountains that way. And it's true. It really is. Last one. Oh, we're good? Okay. Last thing um, before I get off the stage is I have a really cool announcement that I wanted to make. And I'm going to put my little United bid scarf on for this. Stand by. That's dropped. Um, okay, so I, and it seems fitting to make this announcement because, and, and no one knows about this yet. This is, you guys get the exclusive. Um, we, and it seems fitting because we're on the eve of, of the International Women's Day. I sit on the board of the United Bid Committee, which is the group that's trying to bring the 2026 World Cup, the Men's World Cup, to the United States, to Canada, and to Mexico. Uh, and as part of that, one of the things when you're making a bid to FIFA is you talk about a legacy plan, right? And how you're going to make, obviously, the sport and leave the sport in a better place, but also the country in a better place. And I don't know if you realize this, but in soccer and in sports specifically across the board for all international federations. So all the international federations like FIFA run soccer, FIBA runs basketball, FISA runs swimming. So all these different international sports federations, there is a major, major issue with women being underrepresented in all these, uh, in all these federations in the sporting world. So for example, only 16% of women comprise the board for all these international federations. 10% of women make up the executive C-suites, so the senior levels of management. And so what happens is you have very few women and people of diversity in a position to actually make decisions, which is a huge issue. So as part of the legacy for our United bid, uh, all three countries have come together to say, we're going to address this issue. And we're going to address it in an incredibly meaningful way with some measurables that we're willing to put out there that we're going to try and get to. So to announce what those are, as I mentioned before, my former women's national team teammate, Mary Harvey, who World Cup champion, 1991 team. Yes. Um, 
She is also a consultant for the bid as well. So, Harv, can you give a rundown of what's going in our legacy bid book? I on? Okay. Yes. Hi, Jules. Your singing voice has improved, by the way. Thank you. Um, so this is from uh, section 21 of the bid book, leadership and staffing. Uh, the bid book is not yet public, but it will be public when we submit it to FIFA on March 16th. Leadership and staffing. We commit to the following goals. Boards and committees, 50% diversity-based representation on the board and key committees, including a minimum of 30% women. Senior management roles, 50% diversity-based representation of senior executives, including a minimum of 30% women. Performance accountability. We will include the hiring of women and diverse candidates to the United 2026 workforce into the performance plans of senior leadership. We will have a zero tolerance policy for discrimination or harassment, including sexual harassment. And finally, we will establish diversity and inclusion benchmarks, including a guarantee to provide equal pay to staff regardless of gender. We will be transparent about our performance against these benchmarks and submit to independent reviews on our performance towards these benchmarks every 24 months throughout the life cycle of the event and based on these findings, make appropriate changes as, needing, as needed to ensure we fulfill these commitments. Yeah! Thank you, Harv. Uh, and I mean, the magnitude of this is incredible because when you look at, and why that 30% is so important, when you look at a, across the board, when other countries have put that measurable in there, what it does is it brings a critical mass to the room. So now it's not just an isolated voice, it's actually a voice that is being echoed and amplified by other women, by other uh, people of diversity. And so all corporations and companies that have done this, there's so many studies that have shown, actually are that much more productive, right? And profitable and successful when they bring diversity and gender inclusion into their board. And for us to put it in writing is something that we obviously stand for. And the other component of it is there's also gonna be a real recognition at the grassroots level, which is huge for us, for countries like Mexico, where there's a gap with women and girls playing compared to boys, that they're gonna try and escalate those numbers and close that gender gap as well. So big round of applause for Mary Harvey for her work on that. And thank you to US Soccer for hosting this incredible summit. I know it's our first time doing it, and I hope you guys will all come back and, and join us again. And Nike for having us here today. Thank you.